Welcome again to everybody. It's wonderful in January to be back with everybody again, participating in these really special webinars. And um, for those of you who are joining for the first time, um, welcome. And for those of you who are back uh, for the manyth time, so lovely to have you and welcome. We're thrilled to have Dr. Rebecca Clifford with us this evening. And just to uh, make the point that Dr. Clifford hasn't been well, in particular, has had a challenge with her voice box and nonetheless has graciously agreed to host this evening and to speak to us, um, which is remarkable. And Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. I don't know why I seem to have got been muted. Okay, just to acknowledge the graciousness of uh, Dr. Rebecca Clifford, who's going to use a microphone, a handheld microphone, to assist her because she's had some challenges with her voice. And as I said, nonetheless agreed to continue with this evening. And the opportunity for us to hear more about her remarkable book, which is for sale and available in South Africa. And later on in the chat, you'll be able to... Um, get details of how you'll be able to source the book in Johannesburg and Durban. I'm going to formally introduce Dr. Clifford and then the format for the evening will be that um, Tali Nates, the director of the Johannesburg and Holocaust, uh, Holocaust and Genocide Center, and I will alternate questions and we'll be in conversation, the three of us, with Dr. Clifford. Um, I've watched one of the webinars that um, Dr. Clifford has done recently and uh, we, you're in for a treat. We really are. And that's why Tally and I were so determined when, when Dr. Clifford was saying, I haven't been well and my voice is not great. We were like, please, let's try and see if we can make it work. So we are very grateful that she didn't take too poorly to our bullying. And we are delighted that she's agreed to, to this session. And um, I'm sure you will be too. I'm going to formally introduce um, Rebecca as we're going to call her and, and then we can begin the conversation. Um, so Dr. Clifford received a DPhil in Modern History from Oxford University in 2008, and in 2009 she joined the History Department at Swansea University in, uh, in Wales. Her chief research interests are 20th century European history, oral history, Holocaust history, and memory studies. And her most recent research project involved exploring child survivors and Holocaust memories which has resulted in this book, Survivors, Children's Lives After the Holocaust, which was published by Yale University Press and Jonathan Ball Publishers. And the project is the first of its kind to trace the post-war lives of child survivors of the Holocaust from 1945 through to the present, exploring how child survivors have made sense of their memories as they aged. The book's been nominated for a number of leading prizes in the field, including the Wingate Prize, the Wolfson History Prize, and the Bailey Gifford Prize for Nonfiction. It was just released a couple of months ago, so we are extremely privileged to have this opportunity to engage with the author so soon after the publication and um, the release of the book, and that it's available in South Africa. But um, also because the topic is unexplored to a large extent and really something important and fascinating. So if I might ask and um, if we could ask Rebecca to tell us about basically about yourself and your own background. As I said, I, I did um, watch a webinar that you uh, where you were sharing a little bit about your own background and it did pique my interest enormously. And um, I wanted to know, do you think that your own post-memory post -memory motivated you to, to write this book? You, you mentioned in the webinar that you and your mom were going to actually do an event together in January. And I was interested to know whether that has happened or will happen. So tell us a little bit about your own background, please, if you will. Mary, thank you so, so much. And I was uh, laughing a bit because hopefully you all didn't hear my youngest child coming up the stairs and then crying outside the door. I tried to mute myself quickly as I realized what was happening. I think they're at the point now where they're they're like, oh, mom's doing another event. Let's go. Let's see if we can have a peek. And um, so she, she's gone now. Uh, it's so it's such a pleasure to be here. And I'm feeling 
strange about the fact that not only have I never been to South Africa, I've never been to Africa. And that feels really wrong. I've traveled all over the world and I'm just so, I would just so love to actually be there with you, listening to your stories, uh, because listening to stories is what I love. And, you know, having a little sample of your culture and, and learning about your lives. And I, I'm feeling sad that I can't do that tonight, but this is a, a good sort of a second option. Um, Mary's right that uh, I have a child survivor in my background. Uh, I can confess to being the person in the poll who clicked from Europe. <laughs> so the one from Europe was me. <laughs> and also the one saying I have a, one of the people saying I am related to a child survivor was also me because I am. My, my mother was an infant survivor. Um, she was born in Budapest in July of 1944. If there's anyone out there who is Hungarian or has a Hungarian ancestry or is familiar with Hungary, you will know that is pretty much the worst time to be born in Hungary if you were Jewish. And it's it really just an absolute miracle that my mother survived. In fact, un, un, kind of unpeeling the layers of that miracle is uh, I can see somebody saying, oh, and I live in Hungary today. Then, then you know uh, that July 1944 was a very um, chaotic and intense time to be born. And in fact, my mother, of course, she doesn't remember it. She was an infant, but um, but, you know, my grandmother had, before she died, told me quite a lot of stories about how starving they were and how she had no milk to feed my mother. And it's just an absolute miracle that my mother has not only survived, but thrived. For having said all of that, however, I, I really, I, I guess the first thing to say is that I never wanted this book to be about my family. And so I was actually quite careful when I contacted child survivors and did interviews with child survivors to say, look, I do, I mean, I, I understand in a way my mother is a child survivor. However, this is about you and not about her and not about us. Um, and I want to hear your story without my story imposing itself in any way. And so I tried uh, very conscious, consciously in the book to make sure to keep my own story out in a way. That's also because actually what motivated me to write the book okay I'm not gonna pretend that my own history is not involved in any way however and my family's history um that wasn't the key thing that motivated me so I am as Mary said uh, an oral historian which means I do most of my research through interviewing people about their lives and I love that that's my favorite part of what I do and I've been doing that for all my career and I've done lots of projects um, on the Holocaust and also some projects that were not really about the Holocaust at all, although it surprisingly snuck its way in. When I was a postdoctoral researcher, I was part of a big project on activism in the 1960s in Europe. And because we did so many interviews for that particular project, I started to think about how people tell their stories. Um, and in particular, how you start your story and if you can imagine, if I was there with you in South Africa tonight, and we, you know, I've got my microphone, if we started, you know, talking about your life stories, if I said, Mary, tell me the story of your life, where would you start? And the truth is that we are we're quite predictable about how we start our stories. We generally start with our parents and the town we're from and the situation, you know, the situation of our birth, our siblings, maybe the house we were born. And this is our origin story. That's how we generally tell it. And I started to think after listening to so many or doing so many interviews for this very different project, how do you tell the story of your life if you don't know where you came from? Maybe you don't know your parents' names. Maybe you know nothing about the town you came from. You don't know if you had siblings. You don't know anything about your community of origin. And in rare cases, maybe you don't even know your own birth name. But you still are a person in the world who has to go out and tell their story. So how do you do it? So that was really what motivated me. It was this kind of, you know, intellectual question, I suppose, in a way of how do you make sense of who you are if you don't know that origin story? So that um, was what guided me. But on the way... I learned an awful lot about my family, I suppose you could say. Uh, I learned a lot about my mother. Um, things I had never understood started to make a kind of sense after I wrote the book. And this book is, I, I see it as 
maybe you could call it one in a series. I found this topic so interesting. I think I will work on it in some capacity for the rest of my career. And one day I do want to write a book about my family. And that's another reason I've tried to tried to hold back. But it's been enormously insightful in terms of, you know, making sense of not just my mother, but our relationship and who I am and who my grandmother was and the three of us in our sort of web together. And yes, absolutely life changing, I think. Amazing, uh, amazing to hear you tell about your infant mother and, uh, you know, the, th those connections. And with us today, uh, ha we have few survivors, few child survivors. Such an honor, of course, to have uh, people with us that uh, can, can uh, um, feel what you try to, to tell us. So perhaps share with us what is the book about and i'm very very honored to have a copy of your book it just arrived today at the johannesburg holocaust and genocide center's um, bookstore uh, so maybe tell us what is the book about um, maybe if you don't mind to go a little bit more into the history of child survivors maybe give us some context to what constitute a child survivor? Uh, is it an age? Is it what, what, what did you look at? And what was the most surprising aspect uh, of your research? Thank you, Tally. Um, okay, there's a lot there to address. So first, the question of what is, what is the book about? Um, the book is, I guess there's two things. What is it about and what is it trying to do? Um, what it is trying to do is answer that question that I've, I've told you about, you know, that question of how do you make sense of your life if you don't know the details where, you're, where you've come from? And because that was the question I was trying to dig at, I looked at a very specific group. I did not look at all child survivors. I think there's, um, Tally and Mary and I uh, talked about the questions beforehand, and there's a question coming where we dig into what, you know, how you define a child survivor. So I might hold off a little bit until that comes, but... I am not looking at all child survivors. I'm looking at a very specific group. There are a hundred child survivor stories in the book, which means I either, I, I did about 25 interviews on my own and then I engaged with an additional 75 existing interviews. Um, so I, you can think of it as a hundred distinct stories. And all those children, first of all, they all survived uh, the war in continental Europe. So they all had an experience of, a direct experience of persecution, of feeling that their lives were on the line. This does not mean, as I think we'll have a chance to discuss later, that if you were a child, for example, who left and, and came um, and left Europe on the kinder transport, that you're not a survivor. It just means that I wanted to talk to people who had a childhood experience of living in hiding, or being in a ghetto or being in an internment and concentration camp. And they had memories of that experience, but they couldn't piece them together because they were such young children. So that brings me to the second point, uh, how old were these children? Um, all the children in the book were born between 1935 and 1944, like my mother. So uh, 1944 is obviously you would be an infant survivor. Um, the reason I kept it at 1935, I suppose, is that means a child born in 1935 was 10 years old at the time of liberation. And that just, I mean, in a way it was arbitrary, but it was a way of making sure that, though, that these were all very young children who did have memories of the war, but the memories were fragmented and maybe they were not logical and maybe they, they were just scraps what part of what is really interesting to me, and I'm not a psychologist, but I loved the time I spent reading books of child developmental psychology for this project because, first of all, because I didn't know too much about it. And secondly, because it's just absolutely fascinating to think of how children remember. And I mean, we know from our own experience that we don't tend to remember the first three years of our lives. And even after that, there's a long period where you might have a memory here and a memory there, but it's fragmented, it's fragmented and it's fuzzy. So I wanted to see what happened if you were left with kind of maybe these fuzzy memories, but there wasn't anyone to explain them to you. Because that is how we 
piece together the stories of our childhoods. We've got the social world of our families and our communities that explain, oh, that's when this happened, or oh, that's when you went to see your grandmother. If you don't have that social net, then you can't put that together. So this is a very specific group of children. So what I did is I, I looked at 100 children who would fall into that category, and they traced their lives through seven decades. So basically from 1945 to now. And what I wanted to know is how did they start to piece that past together? And what did it mean to them at the different points in their lives? I mean, how did they think about their childhoods when they were in their 20s and their 30s and their 40s? How did that change over time? So it's very, very much a book about memory. And, and although the experience of child survivors is a kind of extreme edge, obviously. I think almost anyone could read the book and say, oh yeah, that makes sense. That's how I, you know, that's how I dealt with this difficult thing from my childhood too, because we make sense of our childhood so differently as we age. I mean, one of the things that, that really, um, uh, for many people, uh, sort of provokes a the kind of rethink of your childhood is having your own children. So there's these sort of points in life, both as historical context change and as your life change, and maybe you get married and you have children, your, your parents die, you divorce. These life events um, make us rethink our pasts. So that's what the book is about. Um, uh, you asked about what was most surprising. And the answer is everything, <laughs> because Nothing I have ever worked on as a historian has so upended every single one of my pre preconceptions as this book. Everything I thought I knew was wrong. And I've worked on the Holocaust for like a dozen years, and I thought I knew something. I didn't know anything. In particular, I think um, if you read the book, you'll notice uh, one thing I found um, very disruptive, I guess. Sorry. <clears throat> As Mary said at the beginning, I have a, it's a chronic problem with my voice box and it might get a little fuzzy, but I'll try to push through. And I've got some like throat soothing tea. <laughs> I hate it. It's been going on for quite a long time now, <clears throat> but uh, it sometimes it flares up. Sorry, bear with me. Yeah, take your time. And whenever you need to have a break, I just don't like, I like to say, I don't want to sound like a barking seal, but there we are. Um, yeah, so one of the topics that is particularly, was particularly difficult for me was the topic of family. Because I think we all have a lot of, um, we have an emotional reason to want to believe, for example, that the best outcome for a child survival would be to be returned to his or her family of origin. We want to believe that because we want to believe in the sort of redemptive power of families, I think. And so it is nice to imagine a kind of scene like at the end of life is beautiful when the little boy finds his mother again and that's the happy ending of the story. And, and the reality was just so different in these stories. Again and again and again, I found that the most traumatic experiences were the ones um, had by children who were returned to a surviving parent. And that actually children who ended up in orphanages had relatively happy experiences because there were some wonderful orphanages after the Second World War, Jewish orphanages. And on the contrary, to be returned to a traumatized and impoverished parent could just be such a traumatic experience. And so that was hard to accept. Um, and it was that was probably one of the the big, biggest surprises for me. Also, quite a large surprise was just how far and a difficult one. We'll we'll talk a bit later on about ethics, but difficult one to know how to deal with was the fact that I use um as I've explained, I use oral history in this book. Uh, I deal with a hundred different interviews, but I also uh, every, for every single interview I look at or I did, I then. Um, sort of wed that to archival resources. So for every child interviewed, there is some sort of cache of archival resources, whether it's case reports or um, restitution claims or uh, all sorts of things, letters and diaries that I find in the archives. There's always something from the past and something from the present. And what was quite surprising is how different 
the stories were in some of those resources quite dramatically. And I think we'll have a chance later on to talk about how you deal with that ethically when you've um, talked to somebody about the story, their own story, and then you go and find what's in the archives and it's, it's completely different. Fascinating, Rebecca, and you, I mean, one can see how um, invested you are in so many of the stories, it's wonderful. And I wondered how do you see your responsibility to your interviewees? And in particular, um, the anonymity, did they give you permission to use their names, to use their identity? And also, um, how do you choose which stories to include? Or did you just choose 100 and include those? Or did you interview more? How, how did you decide, no, you don't cut this one? Or what was your... And how do you feel representing this story, the responsibility of that? Can you share a little bit of those? Thank you. Absolutely. So that's getting on then to that question of ethics. No project I have ever worked on has presented such complex ethical problems to me. Some of them I thought about and talked about with colleagues for years and never came up with a satisfactory answer. Um, the question of names uh, is a really good one. So there are huge ethical problems. If, if for anyone who has seen the book, which I think might only be Tali and nobody else, you'll see that I talk about the 100 child survivors in the book using their original first name. So the first name they were born with, where it is known, and their the initial of their birth family name. That was a compromise that was not very satisfying, I have to say, but I had to do it. And that is because of the tension between what I see as ethically right and what archivists see as ethically right. And I'm not saying they're wrong. We're both right in a way. So I had a really interesting conversation with a wonderful archivist at the um, Canadian Jewish Congress uh, archives in Montreal about this. Because when I used, they have a wonderful collection of uh, case reports about all the children who came as child survivors to Canada between 1948 and 1952. And it's very rare that you're allowed to see uh, as a researcher case reports, they tend to be embargoed, sometimes forever. The British ones, they won't be disembargoed until I'm dead, so I'll never see them. So I flew to Canada because I was so excited to see these case reports. And when I got there, of course, I had to sign a waiver saying I would never use the names of the children whose case reports I was looking at. And I said to the archivist, well, I'm obviously I'm going to sign the waiver because I really, really want to see this material. But it's in my mind, there is an ethical dilemma because what I intend to do is look at these case reports and check the names of the children and then see if I can find those children to, oh, someone's from Montreal. Hello. <laughs> How wonderful. Um, there was just an absolutely fantastic experience in Montreal. Uh, many, many child survivors um, made their, came to Montreal in that period and made their lives in Montreal as well. Um, so in any case, I said, look, here's what I'm intending on doing. I'm going to look at the names and then I'm going to try to find these children, children all grown up, and I'm going to interview them or I'm going to see if they've already given interviews to another scheme. But the problem is when people give interviews, they generally do so in their own name. And I think you have a deep right to maintain uh, to the connection between your story and your name, right? And especially for these ch children, these child survivors who were so often robbed of everything, right? Their, their parents, their siblings, their homes. I didn't want to be the one who then robs them of the, their names on their stories. And ethically, it seems to me, if you have given an interview and you've used your own name and you don't want to be anonymous, you should have the right not to be anonymous. And the archivist said, that's so interesting, I never thought about it like that. Because the reason we ask you to sign the waiver is because of identity theft. And we have had some cases of identity theft. And I think we both were just looking at each other, oh my goodness, I never thought about it from that perspective. In the end, it turned out that there were many archival um, collections that I had to sign waivers for, for reasons of privacy and data protection and identity theft. And so the compromise eventually in the book was that we just um, used their real first names and, and their last initials. 
And I was not very satisfied with that compromise, but I could not see a way to solve the problem. The, the issue of identity theft is real. And the issue of, you know, owning your story is also real. And there was no, there was no compromise. Um, there are other ethical issues that came up with the book too, in terms of representing stories. And I've alluded to one already. It's the problem of what you do when you've interviewed someone or you've listened to their existing interview and they've told their story. And then you go and look at the archival records and the story there isn't the same. There is a real, that was a very uh, difficult issue, a sensitive issue. The last thing I would ever want to do is suggest that someone is lying. But there are really good reasons why children had to lie about their histories. And actually the Canadian example gives us a good one. This may also be true for the South African post-war immigration scheme, which I think had a, uh, if I'm not mistaken about that scheme, it wasn't a very big scheme. I think it had a cutoff age of 12. Does anybody know? Tally's nodding. So, so I imagine there's quite a lot of children who lied about their age. Because if you were stuck in a DP camp and you just needed to move on with your life and you were 13, but they were only taking 12 year olds, any of us would have lied. So the Canadian files are really interesting because um, in the Canadian uh, immigration scheme, this post-war immigration scheme, they only accepted full orphans. So there were quite a lot of children who lied and hid the fact that they had a surviving parent. They were aware that they had a surviving parent, but if they revealed it, they couldn't join the scheme. So they effectively made up the totally concocted life stories to mask the fact that they had a surviving parent. So I have an example like this in the book, but later on when this particular uh, man, Aaron B, he was interviewed um, uh, on the Shoah Foundation uh, oral history project, which we can maybe talk a bit about later. It's an absolutely huge oral history uh, project with, with Holocaust survivors. Um, he doesn't he doesn't allude at all to the fact that he lied for years about the fact that his mother was alive. I think, well, this is a it's a delicate issue, but any of us can understand with compassion why he felt compelled to lie and why then at the other end of his life, he might want, not want to reveal that he lied. So what I just tried to do in those cases was tell that story with humanity. What else can you do? I think we learn a lot by um, not covering up the fact that there's a real disjuncture between oral history and the archival record, but being honest about why there is a, a, a disjuncture. So you, you spoke um, about oral history and looking at archives, and uh, you mentioned the um, USC Shoah Foundation archive, of course, that uh, for, for the audience here, you remember when Schindler's List came in 1993, uh, Steven Spielberg then decided to start this huge interview process. And today, uh, our friend, Dr. Steven Smith, that is uh, uh, one of our patrons and the CEO of the uh, Shoah Foundation, uh, shares with us that there are 55,000 such uh, such testimonies. And by the way, for those survivors here that never had the opportunity to give their survivors testimony, uh, the USC Shoah Foundation just started a last chance interview process. If you did not give your testimony yet and you would like to, please just let us know and we will facilitate that. But Rebecca, back to you. So you said, you interviewed about 25 and then the others you looked at oral history archives. And there are many, there is the Yale archive, there is the USC Shoah Foundation archive. Uh, Durban has their own archive, we have our own archive. So how do you deal with, you know, with archives? And, uh, and many times also the testimonies are very different. I know that the way the Shoah Foundation was interviewing was very different than Yale, for example or from, from, from others. So I would like you to talk a little bit about, about that. Um, did you look at early archives, the border archive or, or other archives? And also I would very much like to ask you to share with us, um, maybe when you listen to some of those interviews and you, uh, and you listen to interviewees that dealing with lack of memories, 
you know, just do not remember, too young, too tra traumatized. Um, what, what was that about? Can you share a little bit about that? And, uh, and maybe finally, can you speak a little bit about the interv interviewee himself or herself? Do they allow for silences? Do they allow for gaps? Do they allow for emotions, crying? you know, or anything like that. I'm really curious about that. Thank you for that great question. I, there is a chapter in the book about this, but I also feel that I could just talk and think about it for the rest of my life because I was, I surprised myself um, by the fact that I ended up finding the historical interviews. So the ones done for other big projects, as Telly has said, the Shaw Foundation project or the Yale project or some different projects I'll mention in a minute, I actually found them much more useful in a way than the, the interviews I did myself. And that's because, of course, they, I, I, um, I said before that I tried to piece together, you know, how child survivors in, approached their past at different points in their lives. But there's a big question of how you do that, because we don't tend to write down, I am now thinking about my past in this way, right? You have to get creative about how you're going to sort of unpick that. And there were, I mean, I, there were lots and lots of archival records for the late 40s, 50s, when, for example, many child survivors were living in care homes. And so the care home staff were keeping records on them or, you know, they had in the care home collections, there are letters and diaries and stuff like that. And then child survivors became adults and they disappear out of the archives at that point for a while trying to find evidence that's not reflective evidence from a later time about how let's say a child survivor born in 1938 was thinking about her past when in like 1960 very hard uh, oh sorry I, can you hear me okay the microphone seemed to go on and off okay um and so I actually really loved and valued some of those older interviews. Now, uh, Tally asked about the Boder collection. This is a collection made by David Boder, um, sort of on the ground in the DP camps in the late 1940s. I didn't because Boder didn't interview any young children. That's why the, the youngest child he, served, he interviewed was born in 1934, I think. So it didn't fall into... Um, the categories that I used. I did use some written testimony by very young child survivors that was recorded shortly after the war. But in terms of uh, oral interviews, the earliest ones that I was able to find date from the late 1970s. I think 1978 is the earliest one I use in the book. I just love these because they capture a person at that moment in time. And in some ways, they just look so different from what we might say today. Uh, so I actually tried really hard to, to find as many of those as I could. Um, because if you think about it, late 1970s, many child survivors, they were in their, in their 40s, early 40s, late 30s. They were starting kind of their careers. Of when they were establishing themselves in their careers, they had their own small children. And so oral interviews from that time like, capture a little slice of how they were feeling right then and, and there. The most interesting... Um, collection I found that spoke to that moment is a collection created by the psychoanalyst Judith Kestenberg, a New York-based um, and psychiatrist who did a big study on child survivors uh, that I think launched in 1981 and then continued until she actually uh, collected 1,500 interviews. Absolutely amazing collection. Uh, it's currently housed in Jerusalem. But Kestenberg was a, a psychoanalyst, and she had a very sort of um, psychoanalyst approach to the purpose of those interviews. And so Tali was asking about how the frame kind of um, structures the interview, as it were. And I talk about that quite a lot in the book, because they're, these are very psychoanalytically minded interviews. And there's a lot of probing in terms of feelings um, and in terms of memories and making sense of the memories. There's also a lot of influence in those interviews of, uh, I don't want to say fashions, that doesn't sound right. But of course, at the time, this was also in, in America, um, there was a growing trend towards this idea of um, 
reclaiming childhood memories through things like hypnosis and guided imagery. And while those are largely discredited in some ways uh, techniques now for in terms of reclaiming early childhood memories, um, they were very much in vogue at the time. So you find in those interviews a lot of, okay, close your eyes and try to imagine. It's interesting because we are talking about children who cannot piece together their memories. So, I'm oh, sorry, gross and sick. We're talking about adults who cannot piece together their childhood memories. So it's quite interesting then to listen to an interview in which the interviewer says, okay, well, don't worry if you, if you don't remember, just try to imagine what you think happened. Now, in a way, for some child survivors, that was a, an optimal way to tell their story because it allowed them to fill in the gaps that they didn't know. And other child survivors really, I, I, I think, really took offense, actually. They only wanted to say what they felt sure about, and they didn't want to fill it in with kind of creative imaginings. And so they sort of pushed back against the, the interviewer. And I think, I mean, this is the thing about the frame of an interview. The interviewer might go in thinking, okay, I want to get into the, you know, psychological trauma, for example. But the interviewee might not want to talk about that. And they have a lot of agency in the interview too. And so you, there is a quite, quite, quite challenging back and forth in some of those interviews that is very interesting. Um, oh my goodness, someone's saying Dr. Keston. <laughs> Miriam has said that Dr. Kestenberg interviewed her. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yours yes. must be part of that collection then. Yes, she interviewed me here in Miami, Florida. I don't want to take up your time, but she laid quite a trip on me that was very difficult for me to overcome. My mother's twin sister died in Auschwitz and she told me that I would forever be replacing my mother's twin sister. And I had to live out the past 25 years of my life before my mom died knowing that she thought I was her sister. <laughs> and I'm not crazy about the fact that the um, so I, I really appreciate uh, your talk today, and I don't want to take your time away, but I would love to connect with you at some other time privately about the work you're doing. Miriam, you got to drop me an email. I'll make sure my email's in the chat. Thank you so much, because you, what you've just said, it was really a very common experience. I mean, I don't want to suggest that those... Um, psychologist-led interviews were not valuable, but some people found them extremely challenging for excellent reasons, mainly because there was an attempt there a lot of the times to pathologize lived experience that was very uncomfortable for child survivors. Then we get into something like the Shaw Foundation uh, interviews, and there you've got almost the opposite problem. But I don't maybe want to say that because Tali has just asked people to come forward for the Shoah Foundation interviews. I don't want to put you off. However, the Shoah Foundation interviews, they have a very different frame. They work through a questionnaire and that is their approach. So that means that um, it works better for those who were adults during the war than it does for children because children often don't know the reason, uh, sorry, don't know the reason, don't know the answer to the questions. So I've got some examples in the book, um, uh, examples from uh, child survivors who, who settled in London, um, one of whom is now a really good friend of mine, and she's just absolutely irate as she's asked again and again and again in the Shoah Foundation interview, so tell me about your mother. Well, I don't know anything about my mother. And then three minutes later, can you tell me about your mother? Well, no, I just said I couldn't tell you about my mother. And then again later, can you tell me anything? And she just finally burst and I said, no, I can't tell you about my mother. I don't know. Stop asking me. And the, the thing is that that kind of checklist, that questionnaire approach to interviewing can be so traumatic if you're a child survivor who doesn't know, you know, where there's so many gaps in your own knowledge because it exposes it and makes it unbearable. We all have an impulse when we tell our stories to make them make sense. And so I think that was a very challenge, was and remains in many ways a challenging format. Now, Tally also asked about, you know, is there a way that we can honor the gaps and silences, that we can give space in an interview to, to let them sit there without like digging at them, without making them hurt so much? And I think the answer is yes, um, 
but I'm not sure that in my own interviews I did that deliberately. I think I ended up doing it a little bit by accident. So I can explain that by telling a story of one of the child survivors in the book, Sylvia R. Uh, I interviewed Sylvia in, in Washington, D.C. in 2015. And since that interview, she's gone on to give regular talks at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. She's an absolutely great speaker. And she always kind of tells her story the same way. She had this experience. Um, oh, crikey, I haven't told Sylvia's story in so long. She was living in a ghetto with her family. And there was a raid one day on the ghetto. And her father said, right. I've got to get you through this. They went to the cemetery and he dug a hole and he said, get in that hole and don't come out until you're sure it's safe. So she lay down in a grave basically and he covered her up and she lay there. I, I can't remember how long, it was a long time for a child to be alone in a grave. And she always talks about this as the worst moment, the worst moment because after that, she had nightmares. After that, she really felt afraid. And so she kind of, her story pivots on this worst moment. But when I interviewed her, I had a different approach because I didn't ask the people I interviewed to tell me about the Holocaust. I asked them to tell me about their lives since 1945. And a lot of them were really surprised, but of course that's what the book is about. And sometimes they said, well, come on, why do you wanna know that my life's not that interesting? I said, oh, for me, it's really interesting. So just to bring people around to uh, accepting that their post-war life was what I wanted to hear about was quite a challenge in some cases. So with Sylvia, I said, well, you know, tell me about what happened to you in, during the war, but that's not why I'm here. I want to know about your life since, all of it, right up to the present. And uh, so she told that story. She said, well, there was this moment in, in, in the grave but unlike all the other times that she's told her story, she said, but you know, that wasn't the worst moment of my life. Oh, really? What was? Well, the worst moment of my life was when my husband died. And I love that story because in a way, it's such a quotidian experience. If we live long enough, we will lose our partners. We will see the people we love die, not in the Holocaust, but just through the regular process of death. I thought it was such a radical way to tell the story because she was reminding us that, you know, what she lived through in the Holocaust wasn't necessarily the worst thing that can happen in a human life. That might actually be a much more sort of regular thing. Um, and I think it was just because I asked about their post-war lives that there was room for a different kind of story. And so I would say to anybody who wants to go and do interviews, it just leave room for uh, um, the interviewee to tell a different type of story or ask for a different type of story. You'll be amazed. Uh, people can be quite resistant. Why would you want to know that? It's not. Can anyone hear me? Because that, the last few sentences uh, that I, I, we couldn't hear you, well, I couldn't hear you, Rebecca, so I don't know if your microphone was awful. Did everyone else hear? No, it was just the last few words uh, okay. of Rebecca, but uh, we hear you. Mary, we, we, we can hear you. So okay, you perfect. Go ahead. So, so Rebecca, I, I'm really interested. We have a, a child survivor in our community who for so many years struggled to even imagine herself as a survivor. She was smuggled out of a, the Kovna ghetto in a sack um, in a process that was underway at the time to protect children, to save children. And, but she constantly referred to the fact that Whatever I'm telling you, I've, um, I'm telling you because this is what's been told to me. And um, she really struggled with the concept of A, being a, a Holocaust survivor at all. And then in the context of if she was, she didn't really know. She had a difficult relationship with her own mother. And I, I, I so regret that she isn't in a position today to benefit from the 
this book and your opportunity to share the experience that you have. Because in the webinar that I, I watched of yours, you referred to infantile amnesia. And I think that would be a concept that would be really interesting for the audience to understand the, uh, about, uh, about memory and how much Holocaust survivors have guilt about not being able to fill the gaps. And how does one process that in, in, in your um, in the book, the changing nature of one's memory. So initially the, the fact that you don't know, so you don't speak, and then you begin to speak, but you feel guilty because you don't know. I'd be so interested in that process. First, I just wanna check that you can hear me now. I can hear you now. Can everybody else who couldn't hear before? Okay. And yeah. Thanks. Um, there's so much there that I, could talk about. I mean, to for anyone who doesn't know, uh, infantile amnesia refers to that period roughly before the age of three years old uh, in which we have no memories that we retain. It varies a little bit from a culture to culture, but it tends to be that we start to retain memories around the age of three, four years old. Now, some people genuinely believe that they have earlier memories, in fact, probably most people, um, but a lot of uh, experimental psychology has, has showed that this is wrong, that those, those are not directly remembered memories, but rather a later discussion of the earlier memory. So there's a period of time after the age of, of three, four, when memories start to imprint in the mind, but and you can actually then remember when you were two and even maybe when you were one, you can remember further back, but it starts to disappear around the age of seven. So you lose your direct connection to those earlier memories. So uh, childhood is just a really fascinating time in which um, the brain is developing, but there's other good reasons why memories do or don't uh, imprint in the brain. Um, a lot of fascinating research was done uh, on this topic um, in the 1980s. Uh, really, um, research that I, I found just fascinating to read because it's all about, well, they ask the question, okay, what is it that makes us remember then? If we don't remember before the age of three or four, why do we start remembering afterwards? So before that time, it was believed that it was actually due to the physical development of the brain. But there were a number of quite radical thinking psychologists, who, these experimental psychologists, who started to show in the 1980s and 90s that actually it had more to do with two things. The first one was language acquisition. So there's something about the process of learning a language that helps memory to imprint in the brain. And the second one connected was the learning of how to tell autobiographical narrative. I mean, for an oral historian, that's really mind blowing. So basically, you can't remember things from the time before you knew how to tell your life story. Wow, such an amazing thought. And how do you learn how to tell your life story? Others around you teach you the shape of the narrative the shape of how you tell your story, which of course is different in different cultures. And in fact, you probably have um, a multitude of South African versions of how to tell the life story. But we learn that principally from our mothers. So if you do not have a mother, you probably were later in learning that precious skill. This is how I tell who I am. Put that together with the fact that child survivors often um, were late to acquire language, especially those who survived in hiding, who didn't have much interaction, um, or they switched language. And switching language, although obviously it's healthy for children's brains to acquire different languages, if you suddenly are forced to forget the one you were, you know, your mother tongue basically, and learn another one or learn a series of different languages, which happened to a lot of child survivors, this can complicate your early memories. And so, Piecing that together, look, it's a challenge, I think, for all of us, right, to make sense of our childhood memories, especially if you have lived through a period of, of chaos or trauma in your childhood, which obviously is true for many, many people. For child survivors, there was a particular extra problem of the fact that in addition to having fragmentary memories, they often just really didn't know the most basic facts about where they were from or, or who they were. So as they aged, they had to try to piece together what they could remember. 
and what they couldn't remember or couldn't make sense of, they had to try to learn. So they had to become historians of themselves. So the book is also about that process. How do you become a historian of yourself? If you've got, if you can't turn to relatives to fill in the gaps, where do you go? Can you turn to archives? What do you do if the archives are close to you? For example, those that were on the other side of the Iron Curtain were definitely not open to um, researchers from outside up until like the 1980s, let's say. So there's this process in which there's a, your memory is changing through so many factors. So I'm just trying to think of a few cases from the book. There were many people in the book who described having a real, a very challenging moment of thinking and rethinking their childhood memories after their own children were born, which might not be a surprise to them because it does, it does cause you to have a deep rethink, I think, having children. Many, many people in the book said they had a kind of crisis after their first children were born, or I'm thinking of a lovely woman, uh, Paula S, whose story is in the book a lot. Um, she was okay when her first child was born because he was a boy. But when her second child was born, a girl, she started to think about her relationship with her own mother, who she hadn't seen and couldn't remember, hadn't seen since she was, um, I can't remember the age, three or four maybe, couldn't remember her own mother. But it was actually when her daughter reached the age that she had been when her mother had last seen her, that she had a real crisis, found she couldn't pick up her daughter anymore, couldn't hold her, gave her all kinds of toys, but didn't, couldn't bear to interact with her, had a really horrible crisis of having to, every time she looked at her own daughter, see what her mother must have seen saying goodbye to her. And so it was a real moment of crisis. Others um, describe the moment of crisis being um, when they got married. There's a really couple of interesting examples in the book, but the one I come back to a lot is the story of Jackie Y. He has all these memories and he can't put them together. He remembers in particular this, this lovely house with a long, long garden that went way back to a horse racing track. And he's always asking his parents about this. And his mom just keeps saying, oh, everybody has memories like that. And, uh, and then as he, as he gets older, facts start to drop in that, that complicate his story. When he's about 10, he's at school and uh, another child at school mentions to him that he's adopted. So he goes home and says to his parents, is this true? Am I, am I adopted? And they confess, yes, it is true. You are adopted. And then there's a lot of crying and hugging. And he says, don't worry. You're always, I love you. You are my parents forever. Seems like it settles down. He's still asking about these memories, but they keep sort of, you know, quieting him. And, and then when he's about 15, he is told by his grandmother, actually, you're not British. And this is a real shocker for him because he just thinks he's a regular East London Jewish kid and he can't believe that he's he's an alien in his own words. This is harder because this time he goes to his parents and says, is this true that I was not born here? And now they're starting to be a little evasive and they're like, stop asking us. And his mother says, don't ask your father. It's so upsetting for him. So now Jackie's sort of pushing against his parents. And this was a very common experience in survivor households when the when child survivors became teenagers that they started to push on they wanted to know who they were and they started to push on this boundary i mean it's something teenagers do anyway and and, uh, and there was a lot kind of confrontations happened in a lot of families but for jackie it finally blew up when he got married or when he went to get married because um he wanted to get married in in the shul and to get married in the shul you have to show that you're jewish so he goes along to the shul uh, I'm trying to remember which one it is, but anyway, it's in London. And he's there with his mother and his fiance and his fiance's mother. And the secretary says, okay, well, we need to see proof that you're Jewish. And his mother said, you don't need that. Just take my word for it. And the secretary said, no, I must have it. And so Jackie's mother said, okay, I've got something in the safety deposit box. I'll go get it. Jackie's thinking, what on earth is going on? So his mom goes, she comes back with a piece of paper and she hands it over to the secretary and the secretary says okay that's fine and as the secretary is handing it back jackie grabs it and learns for the first time that he was in a concentration camp which he has no idea about and there's this just 
explosion of rage, actually, that his parents didn't tell him and they're screaming at each other and crying. And finally, it's around the same time, finally, he he gets his father, he, you know, he knows he's adopted. Now he knows it was, it was in a consultation camp. He was in Teresian stat. He gets his father to, he's asking, where was I before you adopted me? And his father says, well, down, down in this town called Lingfield. So he ends up with his fiance driving down to this town, Lingfield in Surrey, a little tiny town, famous for its horse racing track. And they're driving along and he, suddenly he just sees the house with the beautiful garden sweeping down to the horse racing track was the orphanage where he was adopted. And suddenly there it is, his dream come into life. And I just love Jackie's story because it says something about how those memories are there. They're kind of banging away like incessantly in all of our brains actually, except here he's up against these parents who won't, you know, for their own for their own legitimate reasons, at least legitimate in their own minds, they, they wanted to protect him. They didn't want him to know. And so they wouldn't tell him, but the memory was there. And all of a sudden, he was, you know, it wasn't a fiction. It was true. It was the place where he had lived. And this, I mean, his, he tells his story beautifully. So I write about it a lot, but that was not an uncommon experience. And so I think it's that story of how you piece it all together. For many of the children in the book, they still haven't pieced it all together. Jackie hasn't pieced it all together. There's things he desperately wants to know that he never will. Many of um, the, the child survivors I'm closest to, because I we talk quite often on the phone and I go and see them, are the ones who live in London. And you know, for so many of them, they are now at the point where after many years of, of research, archival research, and just trying to find out anything, now they have to admit, I will never know anymore. And that's a hard thing to come to as well. So um, that is so fascinating. And uh, really, I, I hope that everyone will come and, uh, and buy the book and, and read all these fascinating uh, stories. And I have so many other stories, uh, uh, the questions that I want to ask you. But maybe let me lead uh, the last question and connect it to uh, one of Miriam's questions. So if I can ask you about... Um, what Miriam is, is asking, what about those uh, child survivors that did not recognize themselves as survivors? They, they said, we are not survivors because they were not in ghettos or in camps. Uh, and you talk a lot about not only those that uh, did not consider themselves as survivors, but also those that others did not consider as survivors. And we have it in our community in Johannesburg, where some will say, no, but you were just a refugee, or you were just in hiding, or you were just in, you know, and, and all those things that come through. And uh, maybe you can explore a little bit the label of survivor and the development of, of that lab label to, to today. Um, and, and talk a little bit about refugees as well, because in South Africa, as well as in England. Uh, many came as refugees in the 1930s, but suffered, many of them suffered Kristallnacht, suffered humiliation, suffered other things. So if you can talk a little bit about that as a beginning of the questions from the audience, and I will invite the audience to uh, continue to paste in the chat. Thanks so much, Atalia. Thank you also, Miriam, because um, that is one of the main questions I try to probe in the book. Um, although I think I'm less interested in kind of any sort of objective definition of survivor as the historical process that leads to child survivors calling themselves survivors. And there's, um, there was an event that I think was pivotal um, in terms of changing how child survivors saw themselves, and indeed actually developing that term child survivor, which didn't exist before the 1980s. That was an event called, it was the first American gathering of Jewish Holocaust survivors. That was the name of the event. And it was in April, 1983 in Washington, DC. And the organizers of that event took quite a broad view of what it meant to be a survivor. So they invited people who had survived in concentration camps, but also in 
schools and also in hiding and also um, in um, the labor battalions and also in partisan groups and, and lots of different um, pathways to survival, I think you could say. It did not quite include what most child survivors went through, but lots of child survivors went along to the event and they had a kind of shocking experience. And you can literally hear it happening because I think what they did is they enlisted some roving interviewees who were probably walking around with one of those cassette recorders, you know, the kind that you strap on and the, the, the big ones that sit on the side of you, like sit on your hip and they sort of had a microphone and they were interviewing people at this enormous gathering. There were uh, tens of thousands of people there. And so they interviewed, oh, I'm trying to remember how many I counted it up. I think it's about three or 400 interviews with child survivors that are in a collection in the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, a really interesting collection. And so you can hear the emotional responses of those people who weren't yet calling themselves child survivors to that event. Interestingly, even today in the catalog at the museum, those interviews are listed as interviews with orphans because there wasn't, these were, these were of course by then adults in their late 30s and early 40s, but because there was not really any term child survivor, they were classed as orphans. So there were, there, there's an interview from that event that I really love. It's with a survivor named Felice Zed. Felice, uh, she lost her whole family. It was only her and her sister who survived. And so at this event, you can hear her thinking about this very question in the interview. She says, oh, I, I hate paraphrasing her, but I don't have the book in front of me, so I'm going to paraphrase her. She says, I really wasn't sure if I should come here because I'm really not sure if I'm a survivor. I mean, I wasn't in a camp. I don't have, and she says, I don't have a number on my arm. I don't have anything to show the pain. I don't have anything to show. She's crying at this point. I don't have anything to show the pain. But my whole family was killed. Every single person except me and my sister were, were killed. We are the only survivors. So what are we if we're not survivors? Which incidentally is my own baseline approach to who constitutes a survivor because I think that's a really good way to sum it up. If you, if you have survived and the rest of your family was killed, you have to be a survivor because what on earth else are you? But I, I love this because it, it captures this historical moment, 1983, when this woman is struggling to articulate that she doesn't feel she can call herself a survivor, but she's starting to recognize there's nothing else to describe what she is. And it's very shortly after that event that the first groups, support groups for child Holocaust survivors form in the state. So there was a definite connection. And then they spread out across the world. And of course, there are support groups uh, for child survivors in, in, in almost every continent uh, now, and there are hundreds of them. But it was a very difficult process, I think, to accept for child survivors that they could call themselves survivors. Um, so Felice, again, at this, at, uh, at this event, she encounters a lot of older survivors and she narrates them in, in her interview. She says, well, I keep meeting people and they say, oh, you're not a real survivor. You know, you weren't in a camp or, you know, you didn't have this experience, so it doesn't count. And how, how awful, how painful that was um, for her because it was such a negation of, of what she keeps saying, I don't have anything to show for the pain. So I think that um, the fact that then this term, this label, child survivor, emerges on the back of that event was a really important moment because it's not because child survivors weren't survivors before, of course they were. It's that they start to then move from an individual wondering, is it okay if I call myself this, to a collective recognizing we are this. And that sense of a collective identity that we've got a collective story, that it's bigger than just one person struggling, that is a very powerful moment. It is also a moment that really causes a lot of people to rethink their pasts. So I see it as a pivotal moment, but it's also very interesting to remember that in 1983, to be a survivor in the more conventional sense 
didn't mean what it means now. And I was very struck in reading through a lot of the newspaper reports on that event that happened, April 1983, how I wish I could have been there, um, that a lot of uh, older survivors, so those who were adults during the war, went to the event and they were accompanied by their children who were born after the war, so second generation children. And there were a lot of uh, inter uh, interviews with sort of reporters um, from the national newspapers and, and a lot of people saying, this is a very, I mean, it's lovely to be here where everybody's a survivor because, you know, out and about in the world, people don't have such a good view of survivors. You know, they think, they assume if you survived, you must have done something bad to survive. I think we have so lost that idea that it's quite difficult for us to put ourselves in the mindset of like the 1970s and 1980s and remember that there was, there were a lot of assumptions about survival in the Holocaust. One of them was that you, you must have had to stoop in some way morally in the camps to have survived. Of course, now we know that that is not the case, although it was sometimes the case, and we see it in a different light, right? We see it in a different light now. But it was a difficult label to want to take the mantle of, I suppose, at the time, because it was really fraught. So it was a very, um, a challenging and painful process, but also a very important process for child survivors to say, I'm a child survivor. Also interesting to, to, to know, I didn't know this until I worked on the project, that um, in terms of second generation, who of course were born after the war, um, that they're having discussions about their own experiences 10 years earlier. So again, in the United States, in Boston and New York, the first support groups for second generation uh, children start to form in 1975. And it's partly because of that, I think, that child survivors find that they're caught between, well, okay, I'm not an adult survivor, but I'm not a second generation survivor, so what am I? And there's a need in that context to say, okay, I'm going to call myself a child survivor. Um, but you also asked about uh, refugees or those who came on kinder trans transport schemes, for example, before the war. In my own mind, of course, I don't, I don't talk about um, those stories in the book, but I, I think there's probably way more similarities than difference. Because I do talk about in the book the way in which um, that fragmented memory and that kind of those gaps in your narrative and those gaps in yourself affect you for life and that's just as true for kinder transport children as it is for children who are in continental europe during the war because they too may have lost their families of origin their home communities of origin their original languages the parallels are are quite striking um and I mean, certainly in my own mind, I would never hesitate to call them also survivors. Thank you so much. So, so there are a few questions, uh, uh, if people can bear with us for a few of the very interesting questions. One of them from Marilyn Hallett came uh, via email. And she's saying, my mother was Israeli from Tel Aviv. My father, a British army officer. My mother left Israel during World War II to, to go to Egypt to work, and uh, her aunts and her two daughters died in the concentration camps. I've heard recently from my cousin, who lives in Denmark, that as a youngster, he would regularly find my grandmother crying, and she would tell him that she was mourning her sister and two nieces. This grief, this loss, obviously meant a way beyond the Second World War. And I understand that the grief can go on for years and sometimes a lifetime. But this kind of grief is, uh, is it, uh, you know, on the horror of the crime or not knowing what they went through or not being able to say goodbye or all of the above? And she asked you to reflect on that. Wow, that is... Look, I've already said I don't like talking about my own family history only because I don't want to, I don't want to put it on top of anybody else's experiences. But my gosh, that is, that gets at the a deep core of something I've thought about a lot, I think. Because when I started this project, I did spend some time reflecting on 
on my mother's experiences and my grandmother's experiences and thinking about the nature of my mother's own memories. So she, of course she has no memories of the war at all. She was a baby. So what does she remember then? Well, she remembers exactly what you've described. She remembers frequently being in the house um, in Budapest with her mother and another woman, somebody, a friend or a relative who had come to visit and being aware that the door was closed, right? The door was closed and the other women, the women were in the room, the door was closed, but she could hear through the door that they were crying. And that just being a very central memory from her childhood, the door is closed and on the other side of it, the women are crying. She was also excluded from the process of mourning, although I think she would have really quite liked to take part. And I thought, what a, I mean, that that is her memory of the Holocaust, although it's coming many years later. What she remembers is the long, fraught, grieving, the kind of grieving that happens when you don't know if somebody is dead and you don't know if they're coming back. And she often talks about how people did trickle back, especially from the Soviet Union, for 10 years after the war and people were still coming back. And actually, there's a couple of cases um, in the book of, uh, I'm very interested in this particular orphanage, actually the one that Jackie remembers with the, the long lawn going back to the race uh, racing track. And of the children in that orphanage, there were only ever about 28 children who passed through that orphanage and seven of them ended up being reunited in some capacity with a surviving parent. And there were surviving parents sort of trickling in until 1952. So that's a really long time for those children to be waiting, thinking, what about my parent? You know, they're seeing it happen, right? The, the parents are coming every couple of years, another parent shows up. And so that has these children locked in this terrible agonizing period of thinking, could my parents still be alive? Maybe they're going to come back. And what's that going to be like? And that went on for such a terribly long time. I think it's easy for us to forget that. That was very hard on child survivors and adult survivors as well. And uh, so I think the memories of grief from that period, which stretches on and on, are part of those families' memories of the Holocaust as well. So that, that, that's great. Um, Sarah Cohen is asking um, about those survivors, uh, child survivors, and the stories they tell their children, uh, of did they tell their children, uh, you know, when did they tell the children, did they talk about it? So if you can reflect a little bit about that. It turns out that there's no clear answer to that, and that caught me by surprise too, because I think we always tend to assume that what our family does is is the, the normal process and I was actually delighted to learn that my family is very abnormal in a lot of ways and I mean my mother you know I know I've told you a little bit about her story that I've pieced together but she has never been all that comfortable in talking about this and she has certainly never sat down with me and said here's what happened. My grandmother also was extremely resistant to talking about the Holocaust and only did so at the very end of her life. She, um, she died when she was 100. She knew she was going to die because in Canada you can choose to end your own life and she did. So we had a really remarkable series of rich conversations before she died through assisted suicide effectively. Uh, and it was, uh, that was amazing, but she did so because she realized that I really cared and I had actually devoted my entire life as a historian to to researching this and and she said many times okay you're the one I'm going to tell because you really want to listen so we sat down and did a lot of long interviews and I recorded them and as I say one day I will I really would like to write a book about that too but there are um there is such a range of experience in families so there are families like mine where um, nobody talks about it until very recently. There are families where nobody wants to talk about it point blank, but there are also way more families than I realized that have always talked about it, not necessarily in ways that are, are good. Um, 
there are many, there were many child survivors who described being returned to their traumatized parents who could not stop talking. And actually then there was a, a process where the children needed to shut it out because it was so traumatizing. And there were many uh, child survivors in the book who then later on, after their parents had died, wanted to reconstruct their parents' Holocaust experiences and found they couldn't remember, even though, for example, there's, there's one um, Saul A, his father told him again and again and again about his experience in a whole range of different concentration camps. But when it actually came time for Saul to try to recreate that, he said, I don't know. I don't know what camps he was in. I can't remember, you know, I've shut it out. So there is a kind of um, spectrum, I think, from those who, who didn't want to talk through to those who talked all the time and not too many in the happy middle there. But that has changed with the birth of grand, with the aging, so growing up of grandchildren, I think, because when I reflect on the child survivors in my study, I think there's an awful lot I, I want to say the majority, I'm not quite sure, but let's say around the majority, who really did not want to talk about their experiences with their own children, but who do want to talk to their grandchildren. It is just that one step removed, and I think so many felt that they were protecting their children by not talking about it, but they don't feel that they are damaging their grandchildren by talking about it. So this shift of the generations opens up space in in many families to talk, but not in every family. And goodness knows um, there were many child survivors I approached who I, I wrote, I wrote to everybody first, I wrote a letter and I said, I'd love to interview you. And I had many responses that were, I don't want to talk about this. Please never contact me again. And I have to respect that. I, I know what it's like to be from a family where nobody wants to talk. And I fully understand sometimes the choices, it's just better it's just better for this person as an individual not to discuss it. And it's actually connecting really well to what Jan-Erik Jan Dubelman, our friend uh, from the Anne Frank House, wrote about the project that he and his wife Dinke um, uh, Hondius in Amsterdam uh, are doing at the moment, interviewing uh, child survivors that were in hiding in the Netherlands. And for quite a few of the interviews, uh, interviews, they never spoke about it. And we know also in South Africa, there are some child survivors that in our community that never gave their testimony yet. And he's really asking, you know, uh, is there an advice of how to approach? You said now that many of them said, don't contact me again, but perhaps some said, yes, I would like to talk. And, and is there an advice that you can, you can give as he start, as he's doing this project? I, that's a really hard question. Um, the majority, the vast majority I contacted said yes. It, it was a small minority who said no. It was hard to then have to, I always wrote them back to say, I will, I promise I will not contact you again. And I totally respect your decision and that's fine. I think I tried very hard to um, open up lots of avenues so that anybody I interviewed would feel safe giving the interview. I mean, obviously we have to do this for, for ethical reasons as well, um, working through the university ethics committee, but we always give everybody who is willing to have an interview choices such as you can give your interview anonymously. Nobody ever wanted to, but it's an option. You can remove your interview from this project at any time, obviously, before it's published. Also, nobody has ever wanted to do that, but at least then you, you know. Um, you can try offering different places and spaces for the interview. You can talk about different ways. You, maybe what's holding them back is what the interview is going to be used for. It's sometimes it just, you need clarity that way. But I honestly think some people they don't want to talk and maybe that's just, then that's okay like you you are not going to be able to bring them around but as i say it was not it was not my it was not a common experience i think all you can do is make sure that people know that you will never uh, use anything they say against them some people are very afraid to lose control over their stories. So you can talk about that with uh, interviewees about how to make sure they never feel, they always feel that they are in control, 
both during the interview and forever after. You can promise to share with them what you write about the interview. Um, that can be a bit of a fraught process, but many will like to see the transcript, for example, or talk about what you are going to write or see what you've written. And I think those are all very legitimate things for interviewees to ask. And um, you can make sure that they know that you see their story. <laughs> I keep saying this story with humanity, but I, I, it, you see their story with humanity. I, you will see them as a human being with a vital story to tell, and they will always be in control of the process. You will not go in with your questionnaire of questions, but will let them tell the story they want to tell. And afterwards, you will talk to them about what happens. And I think that's the best you can do. There was um, a woman I would have really loved to interview. And I wrote to her to ask if she would be interviewed and her husband gave me a ring. He said, she can't talk about it, but I'll tell you about that. Cause she wants, she wants to help you. She wants to be included. She wants to be part, but she literally can't talk. And so then actually her husband and I had many long chats on the phone and uh, I didn't use that material in the book, but I think about it a lot because in so many ways, I feel very connected to her story. It breaks my heart to know that she can't speak about it. She can't, no words will come out of her mouth. He told me um, that she, so this is a, a child survivor who was in Auschwitz, um, and she then uh, came to, to uh, was brought on a, on a scheme to bring child survivors to England. She came to England uh, and eventually married an Israeli and, and now lives in Israel. And she would tell him when they were first married that she really couldn't remember too much about her childhood. She did not tell him about Auschwitz. He only learned that much, much later. Um, but she, they obviously spoke English and, and I mean, she did say I was born in Czechoslovakia, but she couldn't remember Czech. And he would ask her and tease her about it sometimes. And, and she said, no, no, I don't remember. I don't remember. And then after they were married, she would scream in her sleep and he didn't recognize the language, but he realized it was Czech. In her waking hours, she could not speak Czech, but in her dreams, she could. And somehow I, I see this as connected. Like there's something there that stops her from speaking, but she still wanted to be a part. Um, I'm sorry, that's a not very good answer, Jan, because I don't think there is a good answer. I think all you can do is reach out with empathy and kindness, which I'm sure is exactly what you are already doing and offer, make sure that, that um, anyone you interview feels that they will always have some you know, creative control because an interview is, is something you make together. Yeah, it's a collaborative effort and, and that is the best you can do. Or if anyone has other great ways that they've gotten around this problem, please, please share them because uh, that's what I've done. Oh, and thank you so much, Rebecca. I mean, there are a few other comments and questions, but sadly, we are running out of time. So I think that that was actually a really candid way and a very touching story and, uh, to end with. And I invite everyone, please, to buy the book. It is available already at our Easy's Cafe and gift shop. And uh, if you will call or email the Durban Center, you will be able to get a, a, a copy in probably the next few days and for all the others from overseas, Kindle, uh, Amazon, Yale University Press, Jonathan Ball, uh, of course. Uh, so so uh, all those partners, wonderful partners. Rebecca, just from all of us, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing with us your, your research, your, uh, your, your passion, your, your, personal con uh, uh, your personal connection and uh, your dedication, I think, to this, not an easy topic, but done in an absolutely uh, sensitive and, uh, and, and wonderful way. And uh, I cannot wait to finish the book that I just got and uh, uh, we'll be in touch with you, of course, after that. Thank you to the teams at the Durban Holocaust and Genocide Center at 
and the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center. And uh, to all of you for coming tonight. And please, will you join us uh, next week because it is Holocaust Commemoration Day on the 27th of January. And we have an amazing commemoration with survivors, with uh, keynote speakers, candle lighting, and a keynote address by the expert in the world about the Holocaust in Africa. And that is Professor Uma Boom from the University of Los Angeles, UCLA. And uh, he will speak about unknown concentration camps in North Africa. So we are very much looking forward to seeing you next week, 27th of January uh, on, at, at, at seven o'clock. Rebecca, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, really. And, thank and you so much. And could, we put, could I just be cheeky and ask if we could put Rebecca's email in the chat? Would you mind, Rebecca? Because there are a couple of people who, I'll put would you in. do that? Yep. I'm I know ready. that yeah, Eric from Amsterdam would like to maybe reach out. So also and Miriam. Miriam, would love to, that would be she great. Put, hey, oh wonderful. Please, uh, and, please drop me a line. Um, at the moment, I will just warn anyone who's writing to me, if you don't know about the situation in Britain, but I'm sure you, you do, that all is utter upside down chaos is in Britain. Our children cannot go to school and we're starting our teaching term next week. So I, I might be a little slower than I normally would to answer, but I will love to get your email and just thank you for coming and thank you for inviting me. It's been such a pleasure. I could see all your questions coming in on the chat and I know we only answered a couple and I wish we could talk all night. <laughs> so we will thank send you so much chat. Rebecca and thank <laughs> you for stretching your voice and feel better Let's get a little croaky <laughs> Take care, we will send you the chat with all the rest of the questions good night everyone good night, good night Rebecca bye-bye <laughs>